All right. So when we set out, when anybody set out to really fundamentally change the way we treat things, you know, usually these kind of very big changes start with somebody having a dream. And there are very good examples of that out in, in, you know, in history. And the most prominent one, of course, or one of the most prominent ones, is Martin Luther King with his famous speech, I have a dream. And he actually changed his world. You know, he changed the world of the black community in the States and probably also in the world in the, in the end. There are other people who have dreams and want to you know, kind of spark changes that are maybe not as political as this one. And one of them is Lenny Kravitz, you know, who thinks it's time for a love revolution. And for loudness and for audio, of course, we need an audio leveling revolution. It's not as sexy as a love revolution, obviously, but we need a leveling revolution. And, well, that's probably the first time why I need Silvio bringing me back here, because he hates revolutions, you know. <laughs> but actually, when we started our work in P. Loud, or in the European group to do that, we had nothing else but the very humble goal to change the world. And I think it's a very good motivation for any work you do. Let's change the world today. Even if it's only the small world around you, but in that case, our world is quite large because we want to fundamentally change the way we treat our basic audio signals. The way we, we actually really treat our signals, which we work on every day. So let's change the world for a change, yeah? Anyway, why, why do we have the problem in the first place? And we have elaborated on that uh, yesterday quite a lot. So we have this one also very objective reason that louder is better. And in, you know, Bob Katz has told us yesterday that even two-tenths of, of a dB changed his perception of the quality of an audio signal significantly. So louder is better. But we, of course, know it from producers, crank it up, push it, it's better. You know? So we know all that in broadcasting too. And the other reason, which we also talked about yesterday and all these days, is that we are metering peaks and measuring peaks and aligning according to the peaks. You know that. So that's the two fundamental reasons why we have this loudness problem also in broadcasting. It's, yeah, it's in a different flavor as in the music industry, you know? It's a different flavor, but we have it. We have loudness jumps all over the place because of compressed commercials, because of dynamic you know, documentaries and feature films, so we have a loudness problem. And one of the complicated issues here is that we are not even measuring the peaks in a true sense. So let's take the comparison with the iceberg. So we are not measuring the peak, but we are measuring something below the peak. No? We'll come to that in a second. And that has nothing to do with loudness whatsoever, because to stick with this comparison, the loudness level would be probably the center of gravity of this iceberg. And we don't even see it because it's hidden below the surface. So the loudness level would be the center of gravity which is somewhere here, you know? So it doesn't have anything to do with the peak level. So we're actually measuring kind of hills, not peaks, you know? And that's, you know, kind of the uh, illustration with a picture of the measurement device that we have, which is called a QPPM here in Europe, which, as you know, stands for a quasi-peak program meter. So we're not actually measuring the, the real peaks, but we're measuring quasi-peaks. And as you know, the quasi stands for this reaction time of the meter, which is 10 milliseconds. So these short transients of the hooves that we heard will not get displayed correctly on a QPPM, because at the time it takes this QPPM to show the level, these transients are long gone. So really short transients get not displayed correctly on a QPPM. So in order for them to be transmitted still, we need a concept called headroom. And that has been working very well in broadcasting. There is a certain headroom where all these transients can be transmitted that we don't see on the meter, but that are there and that basically are responsible for the openness and transparency of the sound. So if we cut them off, we lose a little bit you know, of audio quality. People obviously were not really afraid to do that or they didn't care about that because uh, you know, peak limiting is all over the place. But in the old days, you should say, you know, in the analog days where we were transmitted in broadcasting via frequency modulated uh, carriers, there was this con concept of headroom that those transients could be, you know, transmitted. That was okay. 
Yeah, that was that was pretty okay. But when the war loudness war began also to reach broadcasting, these head this headroom was kind of, you know, diminished and diminished and going away. Because we have more and more sophisticated weaponry to squash our signals without introducing, you know, major new artifacts. But now the situation is like this, that the headroom is basically gone. There's no headroom anymore and everything is pushed up also in broadcasting, at least for genres like commercials or promos or trailers. Yeah. So we're still mi in the middle of the trenches. We are still, you know, fighting these things. And uh, uh, Sylvie, do you have a comment? Okay, yeah, war sucks, I know that, and you're hungry, I know that too. So I'll promise you, you will get a fly, but you have to wait until the end of the presentation. Yeah, then, then I'll give you the fly, no problem. All right, just a very quick animation to illustrate that concept of peak versus loudness uh, normalization once more. You know, just to give you a very uh, good grasp on that. So we still have this kind of reference peak level in broadcasting. Yeah, that's our reference. And all those tools sh now should represent individual programs. Yeah? And the size of the tool, so to speak, represents the dynamic range of things. So they are all aligned according to their peaks. So the, the sword here might be a you know, highly dynamic action film. And this one might be you know, a highly compressed commercial. So if we look at the loudness level of these programs, that would be the center of gravity. So as you know, TC Electronic called the loudness level center of gravity. Yeah, so that is a very good comparison. And if we draw that in, that would be these green circles, you see the problem that we have. So if we connect the dots, you see all those loudness jumps that we have today. So huge jumps between dynamic material and highly compressed material. So what did we do in broadcasting, or what do we do? We compress. Yeah. So we compressed, not the hell out of it, but this is exaggerated, but we compressed because obviously the situation before was not satisfactory because these huge jumps were just too much. So now we have the same peak level, but in this case we also have the same loudness level. So yeah, great, problem solved. But we sacrifice, of course, a lot because we sacrifice all the nice dynamic range, for instance, of this feature film. So now with the Sy Sylvester Stallone movie, the dialogue is as loud as the, you know, the gun battle, which maybe would be okay for a Sylvester Stallone movie, but maybe not for other movies, you know? So we sacrifice all the nice dynamics on the altar of this kind of compression loudness normalization. So compression is one solution, but it's not the good solution. Of course, the real solution is loudness normalization. So you can probably imagine what is happening in our case here with these, with these dynamic programs. We get rid of this reference at the top. We get rid of a peak reference. We introduce a new loudness reference level. And now we align every program with its average loudness level to this new loudness reference. That's the idea, that's the concept of loudness normalization, and that's our audio nirvana, where we want to go to. So that's what we want to achieve, yeah? That's the goal. You may ask yourself, why is it only now? It's 2011, the problem exists since decades. Why is it only now that we really go into that and, and really get forward with it? And one of the reasons is that before 2006, there was no international standard how you measure loudness. And as we know now, it's not easy to find a measurement that reflects our subjective impression. And fortunately, it, you know, it was in, in the mid-2000 years, there was light at the end of the tunnel, so that we now do have a measurement for that. And you've, of course, seen and read the figure. It's uh, done by the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union in Geneva, this standard 1770, or recommendation. The R stands for the Radio Communication Division and BS stands for Broadcast Service Sound. So that's what it stands for and 1770 is just a number. And now in the lo loudness community we just talk about 1770 and we mean that's the kind of algorithm that has been standardized worldwide, internationally. How do you measure loudness? And the interesting thing about 1770 is that it is dead easy. It's a really easy algorithm and at the heart of 1770 is just a simple frequency weighting curve. 
So you would argue that because there were a lot of submissions to the testing procedure with highly sophisticated psychoacoustic models for loudness, and actually this very simple weighting filter outperformed all the others almost, was at least on a par, but almost outperformed all the other highly sophisticated algorithms. Yeah. So of course that's fantastic for a manufacturer because it's super easy to implement and super easy to construct. It's a kind of, you know, high-pass filter, almost like a B curve, you know, the B weighting. There's A weighting, B weighting, C weighting, all those weighting curves to kind of mimic our sensitivity of hearing at different levels. We use that for measuring self-noise of microphones. Of course, we use it for uh, calibrating a cinema system with C weighting, for instance. And this is almost like the B weighting curve, but it's a little bit modified in the, in the cutoff frequency. And then we have an additional shelving filter, and that's it. And the ITU gave a name also that to that weighting curve, and they, choose, or they chose the first letter that they thought you know, didn't have any special meaning, and that was the letter K, so they called it, or they call it K weighting. And here now, we all know that you know, we are probably not super happy about the K, because we have that system from Bob Katz, you know, the K system, which is related to loudness, you know, different calibrated listening levels to force, your, uh, to force you to mix more or less dynamically. So I would have liked to have a different letter here, but the ITU obviously was not aware of the K system of Bob, so they called it K weighting. It is not related to Bob, you know, it's just one letter. Anyway, K weighting is this weighting curve which is at the heart of the 1770 process and algorithm. And just briefly, that's how it looks. We have this pre-filter, that's the shelving filter. Then we have the, uh, the, the, the low cut or the high pass filter. Here the RLB stands for revised low frequency B curve. So the B curve revised in the low frequency range, but you can forget that. This whole block is the K weighting filter. Then we have an energy measurement, so a mean square measurement. And then, that's also interesting, we have a gain factor for the surround channels. That's a five channel signal here. So we come back to that later. Afterwards, everything is summed. We have you know, an in integrated log here so that we get a number here for program loudness that basically is similar to a dB. It's a logarithmic value. This 1.5 dB of gain for the surrounds is interesting. It has its roots in our evolution. So we perceive sounds from the back, direct sounds from the back, as louder compared to sounds from the front with the same level. And that the reason for that is that our ears are at the front and not at the back or at the sides. So everything that is direct sound from the back really you know, has demands a lot of attention from us. Because it could be, in the past, you know, as cavemen, that the saber-toothed tiger was behind us trying to kill us and it was just stepping on a twig and we, were, we had to be very aware of that, what was happening behind us. So Andrew Mason from BBC, also very uh, you know, active member in Pilaut, called it the tiger defense gene that is responsible for this, this plus 1.5 dB. It uh, has been under debate a lot whether this is uh, the right value or whether we should use it at all, this kind of gain, but that's how it is for the time being in 1770. So that's the algorithm, that's standardized, and that's great. And so after this came out in 2006, the loudness work internationally really got a big boost. So that's the reason why it's happening only now, and not 10 or 20 years ago, where already also people were you know, promoting loudness compared to peak normalization, but the time was not ripe, there was no international standard, etc., etc. Yep.